So I am Daniel Angles Alcázar. I am here at the CCA and also at uh, the University of Connecticut. And I like galaxies. I like the uh, multi-scale, multi-physics, multi-mass uh, involved in, in galaxy evolution. Uh, so in, as, as many as you know, in galaxy evolution, we need to know a little bit of many things. We need to know a little bit of cosmology because it's the background where uh, galaxies are forming. Primordial density fluctuations grow over time and uh, give rise to the galaxies that we observe today. So we need to understand a little bit of this cosmological background. We need to also learn about uh, a little bit about uh, star formation, how gas gets converted into stars. And also we need to learn to know a little bit about um, stellar evolution, how uh, massive stars um, go of a, a supernovae and affect the environment. It's also very important for galaxy evolution. And we also need to know a little bit about massive black holes because they likely also play a key role in galaxy evolution. So we need to uh, somehow find a way to combine many of these ingredients into um, simulations, models that can tell us uh, how uh, the overall galaxy formation process goes. So uh, some of the specific questions that I'm more uh, interested in are listed here. So I'm very interested in uh, the coevolution of supermassive black holes and galaxies, uh, how black hole feedback affect galaxies, how is that they end up uh, correlating with each other the way they do. I am interested in uh, galactic winds driven by stellar feedback processes and how uh, winds eject mass from galaxies and how they interact with the circumgalactic medium of galaxies. And I'm interested more in general on large scale uh, gas flows in the context of galaxy evolution. And um, um, among other things, I would like to also list a very recent addition to my interests, which is I'm, I'm um, trying to learn as much as I can about uh, cosmology and how we can use um, simulations, including all of these messy baryonic physics to improve our understanding of um, and measurement of cosmological parameters. And so I'm bugging Paco and many other cosmologists around to learn about this. And so my main tool is uh, cosmological hydrodynamic simulations. And I use these type of simulations uh, to address uh, these topics on different scales. Uh, so first of all, here to the left, this is an example of a large um, volume cosmological simulation. This is uh, Simba, where we uh, simulate a volume of about 100 megaparsecs with a resolution of about one kiloparsec. So these type of simulations are great in order to uh, give you the large scale structure and uh, try to do a uh, population statistics. But then I'm also interested in looking in more detail at the properties, internal properties of galaxies. And for this, we need to use uh, cosmological zooming simulations with much higher resolution so that then the statistics is much worse, obviously, but then we can uh, learn a lot about uh, how uh, the internal properties of galaxies evolve. And then, connected to my interest on supermassive black holes, we need to uh, go to even higher resolution to then see how gas uh, loses angular momentum and accretes onto the central supermassive black hole. And of course, I have a, a fantastic great of collaborators in all of these different um, uh, projects. And I say I should say that if you resonate with any of these topics, please let me know, and I'll be very happy to chat about this. Um, so, okay, going forward. Um, I'd like to show an example of these ultra high resolution simulations where we increase the resolution dynamically close to the black hole in order to understand the, uh, how black holes grow. And so uh, the top, uh, the left panels here are showing how the gas distribution in the central 100 parsecs of a massive galaxy looks like in the standard zooming simulations, which sort of looks like not very well defined, right? Fuzzy, not a lot of resolution. And then in the right panels here, you can see how things look like when we use this hyper-refinement technique, where now we can see all sorts of substructure and then follow explicitly how gas falls uh, down to uh, very close to the black hole. And the panels here uh, to the left and give you a sense of, again, the range of uh, scales involved in this process, going from like megaparsec scales here in the top left, all the way down to the central uh, 10 parsecs. Uh, Drummond is already up, so I'm gonna try and at least play one movie. Let's see if it works. Great. So uh, this is a simulation of um, accretion-driven winds ejecting, ejected from very close to the black hole, very fast winds uh, that then interact with the surrounding ISM and propagate outwards and also interact with the circumgalactic medium of the galaxy. And I am super low on time, and I'm going to stop here. Beautiful. We finished with zero seconds left, so let's thank Dan.
Okay. Hi. Uh, thanks uh, for being here. I'm going to talk about how I spent the last eight years of my uh, working life, which is on the Sloan S Digital Sky Survey 4, which is right now entering its last year of observations. Um, and the way this connects to computational astronomy, what's done here, is, is that what I, one of the things I'm very interested in is the use of computational data analysis, uh, uh, data science techniques to not just analyze astronomical data, but to create the astronomical data. So that's a, a, a subtext here. Um, so, well, yeah, the, um, the, so STSS-4 is uh, three surveys happening at two different observatories. Uh, I'll describe them in a second. But one thing I want to note is that we uh, release all of our data on a roughly yearly time scale. Our next data release is in December. Our final data release will be in uh, 2021. We do this on our, our regular cadence. Um, the other thing I want to note is that this is a project that's funded almost entirely privately funded and funded actually majority by individual institutions. So this is the breakdown. 25% comes from our, our friends uptown at the Sloan Foundation, 5% from the DOE, but 70% comes from individual institutions. Um, so if you look at this breakdown, the, our individual institutions are what is keeping us accelerating. It's our dark energy. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I'm competing with Blakesley. Um, the, uh, the <laughs> so the three projects, uh, we have um, EBOS, which is a large-scale structure survey. So this connects very well with a lot of what people have been talking about. Looking at the here today is the large-scale structure uh, of the universe. EBOS finished in February. It finished our basically the 20-year SDSS project of doing the largest galaxy redshift survey by a factor of 10 uh, and measuring the, the expansion of the universe and the growth of structure from here all the way out to redshift 2.5. And so this is a really epical event that we actually uh, completed uh, this project um, or finished or ended or stopped uh, uh, redshift surveying after 20 years. Um, there's two other programs. Um, one is MANGA, which is an integral field spectroscopy survey of 10,000 nearby galaxies. This is continuing through the end of this year. Um, there's m a huge amount of information you get about each galaxy. You get a spatially resolved uh, map spectroscopically. Here I'm just showing the annual momentum uh, distribution uh, uh, shown in sort of the standard way galaxy people do. This connects very well to the next uh, talk. Uh, you can also look at the, uh, you know, the ISM and the stellar populations, which connects very well to the previous talk. Um, and finally, Apogee, which operates in bright time, is a stellar uh, spectroscopy survey of ga stars in our Milky Way, studying galactic archaeology of all the components of the Milky Way, both from the south and from the north, both from the north and the south. Uh, and doing, you know, cartography of the Milky Way and, and stellar astrophysics. Um, and uh, this is stolen from Jackie. This doesn't count as an extra slide because it already appeared. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and so this is, this is the apogee coverage on the sky shown on the, on the dome. Um, so we end in, at the end of, uh, of, of, of next year, but we're being, you know, SDSS-5 is being prepared. This is being led by Juna Kohlmeyer. Uh, the Flatiron is part of SDSS-5. Um, and from moving from the standard SDSS plates to using robots, we're going to be able to cover the whole sky. We're going to be able to do this in a time-resolved fashion. We're going to study stars in the Milky Way. We're going to study distant black holes. And in a sort of separate instrumentation project, we're going to do massive integral field spectroscopy covering thousands of square degrees of the Milky Way uh, and neighboring galaxies. And this is looking at ionized gas and stellar populations. This is like cosmological zoom in observations, is what Juno likes to call it. Um, and finally, in the last 15 seconds, the last thing I want to say is there will be an SDSS collaboration meeting here 
next June here being at Flatiron. And so uh, stay tuned for announcements about that. Thanks. Sadly, no time for questions, but Michael's around, so you can ask him. All right, we got Shai up next. Hi, good afternoon. So uh, it's uh, really a pleasure standing here in front of uh, CCA and everyone else, especially on a day that's exactly three years since uh, day one of uh, CCA on uh, September 6, uh, 2016, where we were six people uh, over down the block uh, at 22, uh, 22 West. So we've uh, yeah evolved a lot since then. And um, so this uh, first slide, I want to give just a very uh, broad uh, uh, overview of things that I'm, interest I'm interested in. So I'm also, I love galaxies, and I work uh, mostly with large-scale cosmological simulations, hydrodynamical simulations. So I was uh, a member of the uh, international small team that created the illustrious TNG simulations, which are three cosmological boxes out to, uh, from scales to, uh, from 50 to 300 megaparsec on a side, uh, which uh, contain also uh, not only dark matter, but also baryonic, baryonic physics, star formation, black holes, and so on. And uh, together are the largest suite of such hydrodynamical cosmological simulations with about a petabyte of data and uh, took about 200 million uh, CPU hours to run. And they are a very rich data set that can be used for many, many projects. So the general science themes I'm interested in are galaxy growth, galaxy angular momentum, and, uh, and how these things are connected, how, uh, how angular momentum is accreted onto galaxies, and also how gas is accreted onto galaxies, um, and uh, some aspects of, uh, of galaxy uh, structure. Uh, in particular, I want to mention two uh, Columbia grad students I'm working with, Daniel De Filippis, who's working on the angular momentum of the CGM, and uh, Bhavna Motwani, who's, uh, who uh, who's working on properties of star forming regions and will now transition to working on the intra-cluster medium. And also a pre-doctoral uh, student who will come, uh, will arrive on Monday and work with us for, uh, for five months. Um, and Chris Duckworth who will work on acquisition of angular momentum in the cosmic web. So that's what I want to get into a little bit more detail on. So you saw in this uh, movie, the cosmic web and these little, uh, all these, um, uh, lines show angular momentum of galaxies embedded in the in the cosmic web. So um, I want to show a few examples here uh, of some interesting things. Um, so what we see here are four galaxies. So we see on the left side uh, the stellar component of the galaxy, and here the dark matter halo. So these are on different scales. This is in the very inner part of this. And um, in, each, in each such panel, we see uh, the, line the red line shows us the direction of the angular momentum is pointing at, at redshift zero. And the yellow line shows the direction of the angular momentum is pointing at in the initial conditions of the simulation for the same stuff that is uh, shown here at redshift zero. Just looking at the same mass, what is the angular momentum at early times. And we see that for this galaxy, this can be uh, very simple. They're all aligned, dark matter and stars today and in the initial conditions. But we can have much more complicated, curious situations. So in this case, again, also for a disk uh, galaxy, actually the halo uh, and the galaxy are both uh, keep their orientation between uh, across cosmic time, but they are at 90 degrees uh, to between one another. Uh, in some cases, for elliptical galaxies, things can get even, even, uh, even weirder. So uh, there you can see in this case the halo is uh, consistent, um, sorry, um, so what we see is that at redshift zero, uh, the halo and the galaxy are actually 180 degrees toward, uh, from one another, but in the init initial conditions, uh, the yellow lines, they were aligned exactly in the same way. Uh, and here in this case, everything, no nothing aligns with the uh, nothing. So, um, okay, so I, sh I should finish very soon, but uh, I want to just mention how can this be, just one point, how can this be that even in the initial conditions, the stars or the barons that will make stars and the dark matter are not aligned, and this, this is essentially because they're not formed exactly from the same thing. Uh, in other words, the initial patch of the baryons or of the stars, the initial patch of the dark matter are not exactly the same as you can see here in two different colors. And um, 
Lastly and quickly, we can, um, so what I'm working on now is essentially plotting distributions of these various angles and, and trying to uh, understand uh, from this uh, the origin of angular momentum of galaxies and through this uh, potentially trying to understand better why galaxies come in different uh, uh, morphology. So I'll stop here. All right, let's take one question, David. A lot of work where people compare galaxy alignments with large-scale fields, and most of the work is compared to simulations that are dark matter only. Right. Mm -hmm. This suggests that we have to revisit all of this. Yes, yes. So uh, this will definitely. I, I have this in mind. Uh, yeah, working large on this structure study definitely. Great, yeah. yeah. All right. Next speaker. Let's thank Shai one more time. Yeah. Here's me, Matt. Hold up. All right, let me get set up. Thanks. Um, OK, hi. My name is Mehmet Alpaslan. I'm a postdoc at NYU. I, too, love galaxies. <laughs> uh, my background is largely in working with large galaxy surveys, so I cut my teeth on gamma and now work a little bit with SDSS. Uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit today about a recent result that we have been working on at NYU. This is mostly work with uh, Jeremy, Jeremy Tinker. So we're interested in looking at what we can find out about galaxy uh, groups and galaxy halos, and or rather the halos that galaxies inhabit by looking at their satellite galaxies. So we've introduced, or rather we're in the process of introducing this metric, which I actually believe has been looked at before, which we're dubbing LSAT, the satellite luminosity. And this we can be derived quite simply by counting up the luminosity of all photometric sources within some distance, let's say 50 kiloparsecs of a central galaxy that you might identify with spectroscopy. In this case, our spectroscopic data comes from uh, the main galaxy survey of SDSS, shown here in black, and we have deeper photometry going down to about four magnitudes deeper from the legacy surveys, which consists of this footprint that almost entirely overlaps with SDSS. So going into some more detail, we can actually, we do some background subtraction on the, uh, on the satellite luminosity that we measure around the central galaxies. And so this remaining measure should be some proxy for the luminosity being emitted from the satellite population of galaxies. So what can LSAT tell us about groups and halos? And this is really, uh, I think, something that's quite interesting and, and a result that I'm quite excited about. So these two plots are from some work that Jeremy's done, where here we're showing you the halo mass of a galaxy, uh, sorry, the halo mass of um, the dark matter halo that a central galaxy is in, embedded within. And this is the satellite luminosity measured. The solid line comes from um, just essentially using a simulation where you have the true known grouping of objects. And so you can immediately infer which galaxies are in the satellite population. And the plotted lines come from uh, simply using SDSS and using some sort of abundance matching formalism to estimate the, uh, the mass of the halo. And you can see this extremely tight correlation with a slope of about 1 to 1, sorry, 1.1, 1 .1, which essentially gives us a handle on the halo mass down to significantly lower halo masses that have been looked at before, simply by using this satellite luminosity. And on the right-hand side, you can see the same information, but recast as a function of the central galaxy uh, stellar mass. Now, very importantly, and I think this is a reasonable question, we show that this really doesn't seem to be varying very greatly as a function of density. So this figure is showing you certain somewhat derived fig, um, values for LSAT as a function of density, but you can see that it's a very minimal difference. And in fact, it doesn't really change as a function of central galaxy stellar mass in many different ways. So the question, therefore, is what other properties of uh, central galaxies correlate really well with LSAT? And what we've shown using information theory, and this is, some, this is a tool that I was very excited to use, uh, so if you're interested in information theory, please come and speak to me. But we can show that the R-band absolute magnitude of a central galaxy is a better proxy for its total satellite luminosity than its stellar mass. What that therefore means is that you could, in principle, use the R-band luminosity of a central galaxy to get an estimate for its halo mass with a higher signal-to-noise ratio and down to lower halo masses than other techniques that are in currently being used. And so if this is something you're interested in discussing, please come and talk to me. But we do this for the sample of SDSS galaxies that I talked about. And in some cases, we also show that certain other parameters, such as the size or the velocity dispersion of the galaxy, also give you a better handle on this LSAT parameter than stellar mass. 
Of course, this isn't all I do. There's a few other things that keep me up at night. Um, I'm only going to focus on this one due to lack of time. I have somehow convinced Google to let me use their auto ML machine learning network for free uh, for as long as I want. And if anybody is interested in helping me find out what amount of time is reasonable before they complain, come and let me know. This is a neural architecture search. Uh, as far as I'm aware, we don't really use this in the field very much, but it might be interesting to see how far we can get using proprietary code. Some questions? All right, Catherine, you want to start us off? So the, um, the satellite, um, mm -hmm. is this working? The satellite. I know that there's um, uh, a number, um, right, the number of satellites are stochastic. You're going to be sent, um, okay, I'm making this up. You're going to be sent. So if you look at an individual galaxy, right, yes? You're absolutely right. There's a huge amount of noise on, on an individual, gal on a per galaxy basis or per group basis. And so really these signals really come out when we're starting to sort of combine large data sets. Galaxy, you mean a, yeah. Of populations, okay. yeah. Thank you for clarifying, though. All right, we'll take one from there. <laughs> Next up, our very own. Hi, hi, everyone. Um, so I'm Karina, I'm a postdoc here. Uh, galaxies are okay, but I do gravitational waves um, and data analysis for, for LIGO. So that's the obligatory gravitational wave plot from 50914, the first gravitational wave then detected with um, the data and the posterior for the reconstruction of the signal on top of it. Uh, I'm a member of LIGO, so I spend a, a lot of time, uh, since, the, since the, thir the third observing run started, I spent a lot of time on the incoming triggers. So whenever something like that happens, like the, the so-called bio-neutron star that happened April 25th, uh, I usually lose a little bit of sleep following up on it, but not nearly as much as the astronomers who have to follow up on this time map. Uh, they are the real heroes here. Or um, the new uh, cool kid on the block, the NSPH from August 14th, uh, that has a high probability of being uh, a neutral star black hole system. Uh, I also have a love-hate relationship with neutron stars. Uh, within LIGO and gravitational waves. So from the gravitational wave signals, you can learn something about the composition of neutron stars from the tidal interactions as the neutron stars crash against each other. So today, with just uh, one or maybe two signals observed, what we can do is we can take them and estimate the parameters of the system, like the masses of the neutron stars in 1509, 14, it, no, 170817. I start mixing them. Uh, the binary neutron star, uh, you can measure the masses, uh, as well as the, the radii of the neutron star, how big the neutron stars are collide were, and from this one signal, we're between 10 and 12 kilometers. But I also like uh, looking at what we can do in the future, once you have populations of these uh, sources, uh, design sensitivity, we expect to see dozens of these systems. So what you can uh, learn from these systems about key properties of neutron stars and the properties of matter inside neutron stars, so here's an example of something um, I, I worked on recently, where if you have uh, a population of a lot of binary neutron stars, you can measure here uh, an example measurement of the mass of neutron stars above which uh, quark matter starts uh, happening inside neutron star cores. So neutron stars are very dense. If the density exceeds certain limits inside their interiors, then quark matter could start leaking out of nuclei and you have uh, free roaming nuclear um, quark matter inside neutron star cores. And if you have enough binary neutron star detections with gravitational wave signals, you can measure the mass of neutron stars at which this effect happens. And that could be useful to, to nuclear physicists um, studying the properties of, of this uh, very, very dense matter. Um, I also spend a lot of time working with something called Bayes wave which is a code um, that is uh, essentially a, a sampler for uh, trans-dimensional parameter spaces. That's parameter spaces whose dimensionality is not fixed and um, it's a variable of the, of the problem. 
And we usually use uh, this kind of techniques and this algorithm for what we called unmodeled things, uh, basically uh, signals for which we don't have good models. So when you have a binary black hole, general relativity tells you to a pretty good accuracy what the signal you expect looks like. But sometimes you don't know what the signals you expect will look like. And we can use uh, uh, these techniques to study them and either detect them or even estimate some key parameters that might help us figure out what those systems we see are. For example, imagine, imagine you get a burst of gravitational radiation that you have no idea where it comes from. You don't know what kind of models to analyze it. This is where you could apply something like that. So we have used this to do a bunch of things such as study the uh, emission and the properties of the emission, uh, the gravitational wave emission after a neutron star merger. You have a final deformed unstable neutron star remnant and you can study the signal. So here are from uh, uh, animation from simulations where the red is the signal we inject, our simulated fake signal, and the green is the posterior reconstruction, how we'll reconstruct the signal as the signal gets louder and louder. So at first we don't reconstruct it, but as it gets louder, we pick up the signal. We can also use that, for example, to study what happens if black holes that collide are not really black holes as predicted by general relativity, but they have some sort of surface then what happens is they have the, the emitted signal has this characteristic structure which keeps coming back at you called echoes. We also use it to model the noise in the detector. Uh, and also I spent a lot of time developing on this algorithm. And uh, so the thing I wanted to put there in the fourth corner was what I was gonna work on the summer, but didn't work. So I'm just gonna say that what I really do most of the time is stare at plots like this, try to figure out what they don't work. Thank you. Sadly, no time for questions. Let's move on. Chen, here we go. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Chen Ding, a student from uh, NYU. Um, I work with Glennis Farrar and Noemi Globus, who's a postdoc at NYU MCCA. And I'm interested in understanding the origin of ultra high energy cosmic ray anisotropy. By ultra high energy, I mean uh, it's on a scale of EEV, which is 10 to the 18 electron volts, which has much more energy than uh, particles in Large Hadron Collider. Uh, in 2017, PRLG Observatory uh, detected the anisotropy uh, above 8 EEV. Um, the anisotropy can be described by a dipole of about 6.5% uh, in amplitude, and the significance is 5.2 sigma. And it raises um, lots of interesting questions. Is like, what, where does, where do the cosmic rays come from? Um, is is it from a galactic source or an acrogalactic source? Is it from uh, one source, one or few sources, or like many sources? Um, but the most intr uh, most interesting question for me is like, what information can be extracted from the information about? this anisotropy. So we built a model, a physically motivated model to understand the anisotropy. Um, we consider the uh, energy loss mechanisms uh, because as the cosmic rays travel in actual galactic medium, it could interact with uh, CMB and lose its energy. And the cosmic ray uh, diffuse in actual galactic magnetic field uh, from the information from the best fit parameters, we realized that the, the majority of the cosmic rays come from sources that is like uh, with, uh, within 300 megaparsec. So um, we need, um, so we think that the cosmic rays aren't coming from one or two sources, they are coming from um, many, many like weak sources. And we assume that these uh, sources follow the a matter distribution, like the electrical structure. Um, our model also considers that as the cosmic rays enter our galaxy, it gets deflected by the galactic magnetic field. And our model includes energy spectrum and, com and composition. So um, this map is our model, the prediction uh, is called the illumination map, which is the sky map of the, flux of the cosmic rays illuminating the exterior of our galaxy. And it's mostly, um, uh, Virgo uh, cluster because it's very close to us. And this is the map of the, uh, this is the arrival map, it's the map, um, sky map of what we observe on Earth. And, and um, this is compared with the observation and this is our model. 
and a model is uh, consistent with um, observation in terms of dipole amplitude and direction. And uh, probably I don't have time to go over this. This is the uh, energy dependence of dipole amplitude, and our model is consistent with observation. But I don't want to, uh, given the success of our model, I don't want to lead you to think that we'll um, never be able to identify uh, individual sources or we'll never be able to find, find out what type of sources that uh, produce such, uh, such cosmic ray uh, because, um, in term because our model is not, uh, is not complete yet. For example, uh, there are two hotspots above this 38 EEV energy range. There are two hotspots that are detected. One is the OJ hotspot hot spot, and the other is uh, detected by another observatory called TA uh, Observatory. But in our model, we only have one hot spot that, uh, here. So um, it's very possible that the TA hot spot is produced by some um, individual sources that is um, close to us, and we hope uh, in the future we might be able to find out what, where this, what this source is and what type of this source is. So thank you very much, and I would like to talk about it uh, after more about it after the session. Questions, anyone? Well, all right, you'll have to think hard and come back at 10 later. All right, so our next speaker. We got Shirley Ho. Oh, let's thank Chen one more time. <laughs> I guess my next slide. You don't want to hear. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Shirley Ho, and um, I just realized I need to. Yes, I just realized that it's been about a year that I've been in CCA, and two things fluctuated a lot since I got here. One is my weight. The second one is how people feel it when I give a talk about machine learning or deep learning applied to cosmology. The first one I think a lot of people realize was flat iron 15 at this point. <laughs> so I first arrived, I lost about like 10 pounds just because I was walking New York City, you know, going from California where you drive to losing all this weight. And I was post baby. And then I slowly increased in weight over the last six months and I started to realize I should start stopping this. Um, so that's why I start stopping to eat lunch and stuff like that. That's why you don't see me just now. Um, second thing about machine learning and how people view it, over the last year or so, my talk had gone from, everyone was like, what are you talking about? This is a black box trying to solve a black box like dark energy, but then using machine learning that nobody understands to try to solve dark energy, to this is kind of interesting. So I'm going to try to see what's happening now with this crowd and let you you know, judge what's happened here. Um, this is using, the, one of the many projects we do is to use deep learning as a fast approximate simulator. We need to come up with acronym better than fast, I guess. Um, we went from analytical approximation of the universe, which is just gravity, very simple ones. And usually to go to a full n-body simulation, you take about 1.8 million seconds. So instead of doing that, we do it in 0.03 seconds with deep learning. I'll tell you a tiny bit more than that later. And then we did the next thing, which is uh, using the Illustra simulations, which takes, I don't know how many million CPU hours, you tell me here. And if you consider that, you know, Illustra, you only care about the positions of galaxies and the gas, you know, density, then we can produce it in 0.8 hours right now with machine learning. So these are papers run by students, actually some of them are master students. So let me tell you a little bit more details about those guys. Um, so modeling the n-body dynamics with deep learning, um, the first part, the upper part, I'll try to use the stick just like here, because I'm kind of short. Um, the analytical approximation, the percentage dark matter we use in the input and the training is about 30%. We train this neural net, it takes about 0.03 seconds to produce n-body simulations that's with you know, positions and velocities and the same latent parameters of cosmology. That's cool. What uh, CEO Hei, who just graduated from here, and Ying Li, who's arriving soon, has led, have led, is that they can also take the approximated you know, universe that has 10% or 50% dark matter, feed into the same network that was trained with dark matter percentage 30%, and output the correct 
full end body simulations with the correct positions and velocity with the different latent parameters. So the machine learning people got really excited because they said, why would it work? Because the training set is different from the test set. So that's a mystery. We got published in something very famous because I think nobody understands what's happening, including us. So we're working on that. Any suggestions would be very useful. The next thing we did is try to model gas, galaxy, and something else. Um, here is to model the galaxies. Um, we tried to model what's happening in Illustris. So we went from using something very similar to the network you saw earlier from dark matter to galaxy and produce a galaxy two-point functions. And for those who don't care, it's basically how galaxies correlate with each other. And you can do it with something called halo occupation distribution, this is benchmark model usually. Um, don't like it, look at the movie yet. Uh, <laughs> and you can see that that's the benchmark, which is the orange line, which works really well at large scales. And I, I love it, because this is k equals one. This is really, really small scale further down. And it's very hard to model with anything we know analytically. But with machine learning, you can see that our method here, the blue line, is basically slightly different from the target until you hit the shot noise. That's the galaxies. And for the gas, here is the X1, so hydrogen. And you can see the two-point correlation function here again. The XOD model is significantly under predicting how much power it is in you know, k equals to one or 10, actually 10, a few, and 100. While our model, we're able to predict basically very closely to what illustrious TNG is able to do, all in about 0.08 hours, which is basically five minutes. And something even crazier that we're doing right now these days is to try to use a network. Can you play the movie or should I do something about this? Yes. Um, to try to use a network to predict from the laminar state, which hopefully will show up soon like this, to the turbulent state, which will come up with all these little islands in there. So that's the next crazy project we're trying to do using machine learning. So if you are able to you know, do hydrodynamics, can you go from for example, a plasma, like very simple laminar flow to something so turbulent. I will stop right here. All right, no questions. It's going to be a session with no questions unless you guys <laughs> keep it on time. All right, Colin, four minutes. <laughs> Challenge accepted. We'll see if I can do it. Um, all right, hi everybody. Let's see if this loads. All right, uh, I'm Colin Hill. Um, many of you know me, I've been in the area for a while, but I've just started as an assistant professor in the physics department at Columbia, which I'm quite excited about. Um, and uh, I'm also splitting uh, my time 50-50 here at Flatiron uh, for the first three years uh, as an ARS. So I work in cosmology. Um, I spend a lot of my time working on various cosmic microwave background experiments. Uh, including these ones that I've listed here. Um, I also work on some other um, things like gravitational lensing as well. Um, I'm going to just show you some nice pictures of the Simons Observatory, which um, is uh, one of these future experiments that uh, you've probably heard people talking about. But I just want to emphasize that this is something that's actually happening. Um, so I'll use the big stick as well. Uh, this is the cryostat for the Large Aperture Telescope. Uh, which is one of the four telescopes involved in the Simons Observatory. It's this one. We also have three small aperture telescopes focused just on primordial B modes. Uh, this thing is pretty big. It's something like a few meters across and can hold up to 60,000 um, detectors. And it, the whole thing is cryogenically cooled to just a fraction of a Kelvin, which is pretty amazing. Uh, this is the site where we're building SO. This is the ACT experiment right there. Um, and we just had ground breaking a few months ago. That's Jim Simons. Uh, David, uh, Marilyn Simons as well. Um, and we'll have first light in 2021. So this is super exciting. So let me tell you a little bit about some of the science that we want to do with SO. So my interests kind of divide into two areas. Uh, first is doing extragalactic astrophysics with CMB, where we use the CMB as a backlight to essentially illuminate all the structure uh, in the universe between our vantage point over here at redshift zero and the surface of last scattering at redshift 1100. So this includes things like gravitational lensing of the CMB, uh, the sunyaev zeldovich effect, which is just the Compton scattering of CMB photons off of free electrons. So uh, with 
current data from ACT and Plank, um, we have built the highest uh, resolution and highest signal to noise um, map of the uh, thermal scene of Zoldovich effect to date, taking advantage of our multi-frequency data. Um, so if you are um, interested in things like the properties of, of the gas in galaxies, uh, this map is um, incredibly powerful for that. So you can just look by eye here, all these red spots in this map are the location of actual uh, galaxy clusters um, in the sky. So this is pretty exciting. This is with uh, Matt Matavachral, who's at Perimeter, and Sigurd Ness, who's a CCA -er as well. All right, and then um, my interests also intersect with uh, doing fundamental physics with the CMB. So as you've probably heard, there is a problem with the uh, Hubble constant, H naught. Um, it seems like the main activity at cosmology conferences these days is deciding what to call this problem. I'm calling it the H naught conundrum here, but feel free to offer up your favorite uh, synonyms for what we should call it. So basically the expansion rate of the universe inferred from measurements of the CMB uh, or light element abundances uh, plus BAO, baryon acoustic oscillations, and other data tends to come out lower than the expansion rate that is directly measured uh, with the traditional distance ladder method, which uh, presumably you've heard about. So there's been some interest in whether new physics might be responsible for this tension. Um, it turns out that, uh, well, so one might imagine introducing new physics in various um, places in the cosmological history, um, but one of the uh, challenges is that if you introduce new physics in the early universe where you might hope to alter the inference uh, from here, that you tend to break uh, observations of the CMB, which uh, of course has been measured extremely well by many experiments. So it's been pointed out that uh, there are ways to modify the uh, dynamics of the universe prior to recombination in such a way that you can alter H naught uh, without breaking the TT power spectrum, the temperature power spectrum of the CMB. So this is an example of such a model. Uh, the blue curve that lies underneath the orange curve is a lambda CDM model fit to Planck data. And the orange curve is this exotic uh, scalar field model that I can tell you more about if you're interested. But the key takeaway is just that the Hubble constant associated with the orange model uh, is consistent uh, with the late time uh, measurements, whereas the, the blue one is not. So I think that that's pretty cool. However, no one has looked at uh, how this affects uh, large scale structure measurements. So what we're working on right now with some collaborators at Brown is uh, how the matter power spectrum changes uh, in these models. And as you can see in this plot, the changes are on the level of five to 10%, including for modes that we can actually measure uh, at high signal to noise. So these could put some interesting constraints on these uh, scenarios. Okay, thank you. I did not succeed. <laughs> All right, we'll keep you anyway. Okay, David, finish us off strong. Maybe even on time. Bye. Okay, so what I want to talk about is using the cosmic microwave background and large scale structure observations to constrain alternative gravity theories. And this is work done with Chris Pardo, who is defending his thesis on Monday. And uh, the idea here is there's this remarkable agreement between the CMB temperature. Uh, power spectrum, what we see in large scale structure. And lot, you know, the success of this model has been, I think, one of the great advances in cosmology. Um, what does this tell us about alternative gravity theories? I felt for a long time that this is telling us that we really can't have a successful alternative gravity theory, but it's been hard to articulate this clearly. And realize that one of the things we can do is look at CMB polarization. Now, CMB polarization is actually simpler to interpret than temperature. Temperature fluctuations are due to gravitational, uh, a lot of terms could come in into temperature. Polarization is simple. The polarization pattern we see in the microwave sky, it, you know, this in Q and U modes, is nothing more than the gradient in the velocity field. You're just seeing velocity fields projected on the, sea, the sky. So when you look at the polarization maps from Planck, you're basically seeing what large scale velocity fields look like at redshift of 1100. So we know what the velocities look like and it's the velocities of the baryons. If I have an alternative gravity theory, 
in which there's no dark matter. Simple. Baryons are all there is. So then I can take this plus the continuity equation, and the EE power spectrum is the baryon power spectrum at redshift 1100, up to some constants. So we know what the baryon power spectrum looks like at redshift of 1100. We also see what the galaxy distribution looks like at redshift 0.3. Now, one of the things that confuses people is you're used to seeing plots of baryon acoustic oscillations. Um, those are always plotted when you divide out a smooth function to emphasize the wiggles. So this is what the Sloan power spectrum looks like. And the reason that people like Michael Blanton and Shirley Ho worked really hard to get big surveys is the ri ripples on top of this spectrum are tiny. They are suppressed by a mega baryon over a mega dark matter squared. That's, so they're suppressed by factor 25. Now, that's the way in standard theory we go from here to here. If you want to have an alternative gravity theory, it has to get from the blue curve to the black curve. And everything is in the linear regime then. So this tells us what gra the Green's function has to look like for the theory. And you can see gravity has to turn, be positive here, negative here, positive here, negative here, positive here. Any alternative theory has to have this behavior to go linearly from here to here. And this doesn't look like Mond. This doesn't look like anything anyone's proposed. And it's pretty hard to come up with any physics that will have that gravity changing sign as a function of scale to cancel BAL. The alternative you might ask about is what if you had nonlinear theory? If you had nonlinear theories, you, we would nonlinearly couple the modes. You'd have a non-trivial three-point function in any nonlinear theory. So I think we can also, we have very good constraints on non-Gaussianity as a function of redshift. We can rule out nonlinear theory. So to, for me, this means the combination of these observations basically says you cannot have an alternative gravity theory explain dark matter and be consistent with our observations of the microwave background and large scale structure. So that's, that's the constraints we've been able to put on, and I've been able to do it within my time. That's why he gets the big bucks. Okay. Any questions for David? Amil. That's correct. You can do something where you have some dark matter, but then, you know, this is the stuff that, you know, people like Stacy McGaw and Modi Milgram have been saying, you haven't found dark matter in the lab, therefore, you know, it, it, it doesn't exist. Now, I think this, I would say that we have seen dark matter in the microwave sky. Any last question? Th that's not, I mean, that also must fit large scale structure, but that tends to change the way things evolve overall. And as long as you have dark matter, you can explain, really, the key thing is the suppression of these baryon wiggles, right? right. So. I guess I was wondering whether this kind of approach could be extended to the. Well, people. we know that the th um, you've got to fit large scale structure, but you can't do the K dependence in the same way for a dark energy theory. So. Um, did I get one more question? All right. Well, you need them to operate on the scale of 100 megaparsecs. So, um, and you need them to do it in a way that maintains the, um, the microwave background's remarkably Gaussian. So the process has to be basically linear to maintain the Gaussian nature of the microwave background fluctuation. So, you know, it's, you can't write a no-go theorem for all alternative theories, but this does give a very strong constraint, I believe, 
on alternative models.